Attention citizens, nuclear strike imminent. Have you ever stopped during your day, in the middle of all the ordinary moments, and considered the terrifying truth that, hidden deep beneath the Earth's surface, there are facilities capable of ending the world as we know it? It's almost surreal to consider that during the Cold War, a time marked by a tense standoff between superpowers, the threat of nuclear annihilation was not just a distant fear, but a looming reality. These secretive facilities, known as missile silos, are more than just features of a dystopian landscape. They are sophisticated and chillingly real structures designed to launch intercontinental ballistic missiles. Located mostly in remote parts of the United States, these silos are the epitome of military strategy and technological prowess, built to both withstand a nuclear strike and to retaliate if necessary. But what secrets do these underground fortresses hold? How does it feel to be in a place built with the power to both protect and destroy civilizations? As we peel back the layers of these formidable underground fortresses, it's essential to understand the world stage during their inception. The Cold War, a period of geopolitical tension between the United States and the Soviet Union and their respective allies, lasted from the late 1940s to the early 1990s. This era was defined not by direct military conflict, but by a pervasive fear of nuclear war and the race for nuclear supremacy. As both superpowers amassed vast arsenals of nuclear weapons, the strategy of deterrence became central to their defense policies. Deterrence theory posits that neither side in a conflict would initiate a nuclear attack, knowing it would lead to immediate and devastating retaliation. This chilling realization gave birth to the policy known as Mutual Assured Destruction, or MAD. Under MAD, both the US and the USSR sought guarantees that they could survive a first strike and still retaliate powerfully enough to inflict unacceptable damage on the attacker. How did they plan to ensure such a capability? By developing a reliable and survivable means of launching their nuclear weapons. Just a quick moment before we unveil the rest. If you're new here, consider subscribing to this channel. Stay up to date and never miss out on the latest insights. And now, let's go on. So, what approach did they take? They began constructing missile silos. But what exactly are missile silos? Think about an underground vertical cylindrical structure built to store and, if necessary, launch intercontinental ballistic missiles, or ICBMs. Designed to withstand even near-direct nuclear strikes, these silos became pivotal components of each nation's nuclear triad, which also included bombers and submarine-launched ballistic missiles. The first operational ICBM bases built by the Soviets and Americans were part of an escalating arms race, where the capability to deliver nuclear warheads across continents highlighted the reach and power of each side's military. For the United States, this era began with the Atlas missile series in the late 1950s, which marked the start of silo-based ICBMs. It was America's first operational intercontinental ballistic missile, designed to deliver nuclear warheads across vast distances from the continental United States to the Soviet Union. There were six different versions of the Atlas missile, designated the Atlas A, B, C, D, E, and F. The first three models, A, B, and C, served as prototypes and were never deployed as operational ICBMs. The subsequent versions, Atlas D, E, and F, were fully operational with eight Atlas D, 27 Atlas E, and 72 Atlas F missile bases constructed. These bases were distributed under the control of 10 different Air Force bases across the United States. The Atlas missile was unique in several ways. It used a stage-and-a-half propulsion system where the booster engines would drop off, but the central sustainer engine continued to burn until fuel depletion. This design minimized structural weight, allowing the missile to carry larger payloads over longer distances. Moreover, the Atlas missiles were powered by liquid fuel, which, while providing a powerful thrust, also required complex and vulnerable infrastructure for fueling before launch. Safety and readiness dictated much about the silo designs for Atlas missiles. Unlike later missiles that could be kept fueled for extended periods, the Atlas's liquid fuel was volatile and could not be stored long-term in the missile. This necessitated a design where the missiles would be stored unfueled and only fueled at the time of imminent launch, adding a critical window of time before they could be launched. 
To bolster their defenses against potential first strikes, various types of silos were developed over the years as the Atlas missile program evolved. Initially, in the first generation of silos like those at Vandenberg Air Force Base and in Wyoming, the Atlas D missiles were housed in simple vertical silos with above-ground launchers. These early designs required the missile to be raised to the surface for fueling and launching, which exposed them briefly to potential enemy strikes. As technology progressed, the second generation of silos introduced a novel approach, horizontal storage of missiles in structures with retractable roofs. This design allowed the missiles to be quickly raised to a vertical position and launched directly from the silo, significantly reducing their vulnerability. Building on this, the third generation of silos further enhanced missile protection. These silos housed missiles horizontally within robust concrete buildings, which offered better protection from strikes before they were raised for launching. The culmination of this evolutionary process was seen in the fourth generation of silos, primarily used for the Atlas F missiles. These were the most advanced silos, featuring vertical storage deep underground. By fully utilizing the underground space, these silos dramatically enhanced both security and survivability, making them the pinnacle of Cold War missile silo design. Curious about some examples of these sites? Take Warren Air Force Base in Wyoming, where the earlier Atlas D silos were a glimpse into the initial stages of missile silo design. Or consider Plattsburgh Air Force Base in New York, which operated Atlas F silos as part of a strategic missile ring, bolstering the northeastern defense perimeter of the United States. And then there's Schilling Air Force Base in Kansas, home to several Atlas F silos. So, what does the inside of a missile silo look like? Let's dive into Schilling Air Force Base for a closer look. This base boasted 12 missile silos, among the most fortified structures of the Cold War era. These silos were deep, hardened underground facilities, meticulously designed to withstand even close nuclear strikes. Each silo was constructed with a steel framework, reinforced with 3-inch thick rebar, and over 600 tons of metal. This structure was then encapsulated in concrete, infused with a special epoxy resin, creating an extremely resilient barrier known as a hardened site, capable of withstanding a nuclear blast within a one-mile radius. The Atlas F missiles, equipped with thermonuclear warheads, were stored vertically in these silos, which extended 176 feet underground. They were protected by 75-ton blast doors and could be raised to the surface by an elevator for launch. The underground complex spanned 12 floors and included a highly secure launch control center, connected to the main missile silo by a tunnel. Security was stringent. Entry involved passing through an entrapment area where personnel would be required to speak a password into a communication system after being visually verified through a camera. Successful authentication unlocked electronic doors, leading through two massive one-ton blast doors made of manganese, which has a higher melting point than regular steel. Engineers also incorporated unique design features to ensure the structural integrity of the silo in the event of a nuclear detonation. The walls and floor were constructed separately to prevent joint failure, and the floors were suspended from the ceiling by brackets. A compressed air system stabilized the floors, ensuring that in the event of a nuclear blast, the internal structure would remain secure and operational, with even the lights mounted on springs to absorb shock. The Atlas missiles, known for their liquid-fueled rocket systems, had a relatively brief operational lifespan of three to five years due to their complex management and maintenance requirements. The volatile nature of liquid fuel and the intricate infrastructure necessary for missile readiness led to several accidents during their service, resulting in the loss and subsequent closure of some sites. Advancements in solid fuel rocket technology soon rendered the liquid-fueled Atlas missiles obsolete, Recognizing these advancements and the inherent risks of older technology, the U.S. government announced in November 1964 that all first-generation ICBMs, including the Atlas series, would be retired the following year. By 1965, Strategic Air Command officially decommissioned all Atlas missile sites. During the decommissioning process, each launch site was stripped of its salvageable materials, marking the end of the Atlas missile's role in the United States' strategic arsenal. Or maybe that wasn't quite the end after all. Some of these old missile silos have found new life in rather unexpected ways. A few have been turned into museums. Others have been snapped up by private individuals, transforming them into everything from quirky homes to ultra-luxury survival bunkers. And for the truly adventurous, 
You can even go scuba diving in the flooded chamber of the Valhalla missile silo. How's that for a splash into history? Would you like to dive down there? Let us know in the comment section below. As the era of the Atlas missiles came to a close, the United States took its next major leap in missile technology with the introduction of the Titan series of intercontinental ballistic missiles. These missiles offered enhanced capabilities in terms of fuel efficiency, range, accuracy, and payload capacity. The Titan program kicked off with the Titan I, America's first multi-stage ICBM, which debuted shortly after the Atlas missiles were retired. This groundbreaking missile could travel much farther and carry heavier payloads compared to its single-stage predecessor. Despite its advancements, the Titan I retained the use of liquid oxygen and RP-1 as propellants, necessitating fueling just before launch, a time-consuming process that was considered a strategic vulnerability. The silos for the Titan I were a step up from those of the Atlas, fully underground and fortified to withstand close-range nuclear blasts. However, like the Atlas, the Titan I needed to be elevated to the surface for launching, which presented its own set of challenges. Then came the Titan II, introduced in the mid-1960s with a host of significant improvements. It utilized a storable liquid propellant, which allowed the missiles to remain fully fueled and launch-ready at all times, providing a crucial quick-response capability during tense Cold War standoffs. Titan II was not only more powerful than its predecessors, but also capable of delivering a larger nuclear warhead over greater distances with pinpoint accuracy. The silos constructed for Titan II were among the toughest of the Cold War era, designed to endure all but a direct nuclear hit. Today, all but one of the original 54 Titan II missile silos in the United States have been decommissioned and mostly demolished. The exception is the Titan Missile Museum, formerly known as Air Force Facility Missile Site 8, located about 25 miles from Tucson, Arizona. Constructed in 1963, this site uniquely preserves the history of the Cold War's most powerful land-based nuclear missile. The underground complex is meticulously designed, featuring a three-level launch control center that once orchestrated the operations of this formidable weapon. The center incorporated a dual-key system to prevent any single individual from authorizing a missile launch, a crucial safeguard against unauthorized use. Its communication systems were robust, engineered to receive and authenticate launch commands under any conditions. Additionally, the living quarters within the complex underscored the constant vigilance required from the crew during its operation. Deeper within the facility lies the eight-level silo, which housed the missile and its associated equipment. This includes an extensive network of cableways, access tunnels, blast locks, and the access portal with an equipment elevator. Constructed with steel-reinforced concrete, the walls in some areas are up to eight feet thick. Several three-ton blast doors compartmentalize the facility, ensuring each section is securely isolated from the surface and one another. The top level of the silo offers a view of the missile doors. On the third level, there's a large diesel generator, crucial for power backup. The seventh level provides access to the lowest part of the launch duct. During the Beyond the Blast Doors tour, visitors have the unique opportunity to stand directly underneath the missile. At the bottom, 140 feet underground on level eight, are the propellant pumps, vital for missile operation. The site was decommissioned in 1984 as part of President Reagan's Strategic Arms Reduction Initiative. This initiative not only phased out the Titan II missiles, but also marked a shift towards more advanced and secure missile systems under a broader weapon system modernization program. The Minuteman missile program represents a significant evolution in the United States' strategic arsenal, reflecting continual advancements in missile technology and changing defense strategies. Beginning with the Minuteman I, each generation of this missile series, culminating in the Minuteman III, has seen improvements in range, accuracy, and warhead capability. These missiles were solid-fueled, a stark contrast to their liquid-fueled predecessors, allowing for quicker launch preparations and reduced maintenance. Capable of reaching targets up to 6,000 miles away, they were equipped with multiple independently targetable re-entry vehicles, or MIRVs, enhancing their effectiveness as a deterrent. A key feature of the Minuteman's evolution has been the integration of modern guidance systems. These systems dramatically increased the accuracy and reliability of the missiles compared to their predecessors, making them formidable components of the U.S. nuclear triad. Unlike the earlier Atlas and Titan facilities, 
All of the 1,000 Minuteman silos were designed to be entirely underground. Built to withstand all but a direct nuclear hit, each silo was fortified with a 62-foot reinforced steel liner, encased in poured concrete to form a robust external wall. In terms of operational readiness, each Minuteman silo was connected to a launch control center, or LCC, which was hardened to withstand nuclear attacks and remained staffed 24-7 by highly trained missileers. These missileers, operating in shifts, were responsible for the readiness and potential launch of these ICBMs. The lifestyle within these underground bunkers was marked by long periods of vigilance, interrupted by the intense responsibility of conducting simulated and real launch procedures. In 1991, in a move towards global nuclear disarmament, the Air Force began the gradual deactivation of the Minuteman Force. Despite the decommissioning of many sites, 150 Minuteman missile silos and 15 control facilities were affected. However, some sites like those at Ellsworth Air Force Base were preserved as historic sites. As we move further into the 21st century, the United States continues to maintain a robust and effective land-based leg of its nuclear triad with the Minuteman III Intercontinental Ballistic Missiles. Currently, there are 400 Minuteman III missiles on active duty, strategically deployed across several missile fields in the United States. These installations ensure a ready and reliable deterrent capable of responding to any national security threat. But hey, getting inside these facilities is off limits for most of us, so you'll have to use your imagination to picture what it's really like inside. The Minuteman III silos are engineered to withstand severe attacks, including near-direct nuclear strikes. These fortified structures are equipped with advanced security systems to prevent unauthorized access and ensure the operational readiness of the missiles they house. The silos are linked via encrypted communication systems to the U.S. Strategic Command, ensuring that launch commands are securely received and authenticated. However, as technologies advance and strategic needs evolve, the U.S. Air Force has initiated the Ground-Based Strategic Deterrent, or GBSD program, to replace the aging Minuteman III missiles. The GBSD program aims to introduce a new generation of ICBMs that will enhance the United States' strategic capabilities with improved accuracy, enhanced security features, and increased overall effectiveness. Deployment of these new missiles is expected to begin in the late 2020s and will gradually phase out the Minuteman III fleet. The Minuteman III missiles are primarily stationed in three major missile fields. The F.E. Warren Air Force Base in Wyoming, the Malmstrom Air Force Base in Montana, and Minot Air Force Base in North Dakota. Each base is a critical component of U.S. national defense infrastructure, with each silo kept in a state of continuous readiness through meticulous maintenance and regular technological upgrades. These bases not only serve as deterrents, but also as testaments to the enduring vigilance required to maintain peace and security.